you know, eventually what happened, Ken was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. You don't respect me as your man. Ah, ah, ah. And Rita was like, okay. Okay, bye. Hello, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And if you are not already a part of our Bella Book Club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on YouTube. Now, let's talk about um, Respect, The Life of Aretha Franklin. Let's see which one we on now, number 19. Okay, so where we left off, Love Bugs, and I'm sorry if you can hear uh, the dryer drying, but I gotta do my house chores. And anyway, where we left off in part 18, Riri had threw a big shindig for her birthday, right? And she went right up to the Quincy and the Jones and said, nigga, you, you, you gonna be producing my next album because Aretha Franklin knew of how uh, grand Quincy Jones was because of his work with a previous Atlantic artist, Ray Charles. Y'all know who that nigga is, you know? He tell how beautiful you are by the size of your arm. You know, he look at your arm, rub your hoe, yes, girl. You're going to be old meaty lady. Yes, boo. Question was yes. this. Although Quincy Jones was genius, he had a tendency to be full of shit, to miss deadlines, to not show up. He was not suited for somebody like Aretha, who already has flaky tendencies herself. Okay, so Cecil, Aretha's brother, had said, you know, it was disappointing that the album that they did together had very little success. Okay. Cecil said that Quincy Jones was juggling all kinds of projects. He was writing for the movies, TVs, and producing in the studios. He said that him and Riri both loved Quincy, but God damn it, his work with Aretha Franklin was less than stellar. So much so that when he did his autobiography, he ain't even mention the project that he did with uh, Aretha Franklin because it was so less than stellar. And I believe that he was ashamed that he had such a great, a, a great artist there and he didn't utilize her appropriately. So when people be asking him, hey, what about that project that you did with um, Aretha Franklin? I'm sorry, what, what, what are you talking about? Who, re, blick, black, blick, blick, what, beep, block, biggity, boop, boop. So what was delivered from the sessions that started in the spring and didn't conclude till late summer was disappointing. Mm -hmm. I bet it was. That Quincy Aretha project, Hey Now Hey, The Other Side of the Sky, was Aretha's first Atlantic album that did not land in the top 25 on the pop chart. So it did okay in R&B, but you know, that's not good enough for musicians. They want both. Gotta find me an angel, hey, to fly away with me. Gotta find me an angel. Now, as Aretha Franklin said in the beginning of Gotta Find Me an Angel, Carolyn wrote it for her, okay? Now, Irma says that this was the most profound song that Carolyn ever wrote. It solidified her as a competitor with the greats, okay? Irma said that all of us, Daddy, Cecil, um, and herself, were most proud of this project with Aretha. Now, moving on, Ken Cunningham, you know, he's still lurking. Now, he ain't lurking like Teddy Pimpy Whitey, okay, but he is lurking, okay, but he has a good heart, 
right? His heart is that, okay, I'm married to a woman who can do good, okay? Although MLK is not here, she, my wife or my uh, lover, you know, or beau, whatever Ken Cunningham is, is capable of moving people with her voice, okay? So what Ken would do is he would tell uh, organizations who were a part of the black, black plight that Aretha would sing at their events. He didn't give a fuck whether or not it, you know, she had to do something else somewhere else that got them paid. He didn't care about that. His mission was to continue the black fight, okay? In that regards, Cecil didn't have a problem with Ken Cunningham. Now, so what Jerry Wexler from Atlantic said was that you will not find many artists who are able to cross over successfully and then go back, okay? So he was nervous about Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace, okay? But factually, he should have been nervous because right after the uh, Amazing Grace documentary and album, Aretha Franklin was incapable of grabbing her mojo back, according to the Jerry Wexler. Wexler said that him and his associates eventually just ran out of material that would work for Aretha and that would put her in a charting or a top charting position, okay? Now, Aretha and Ken were always hatching grand plans, okay? Ruth Bowman said that he had convinced Aretha Franklin, listen, mama, you know, because that's what they call their women, listen, mama, okay, um, I got this grand idea, okay? We are going to make you a star. Okay, and Aretha was game because listen, she felt like if Berta Gordy could do it for goddamn uh, uh, Diana Ross, and if um, uh, who is that Columbia could do it for Barbara Streisand and make her a, a all way round star, then why the hell they can't do it for me? And Ruth Bowman said, okay, he got big dreams, but he wasn't realistic because. He himself did not have the financial backing in order to create something as big as A Lady Sing the Blues or Barbara Streisand's Funny Girl. Y do y'all know I love Barbara Streisand? Am I the only black person that love Barbara Streisand? Am I? Wait, and a little piece of tidbit information. Aretha Franklin hates Barbara Streisand, or she hated her, okay? Not because, you know, she was a white woman that, you know, could be equated with her strong voice. Okay, it was more so because of the fact that they both started at Columbia together, okay? And she felt resentment because she felt like, okay, well, why is Bob Streisand doing so good and you niggas can't write me a damn jingle? The October 12th, 1972 issue of Jet. Jet. Jet will never stop being a nigga in this book. You hear me? Jet will be a nigga. But anyway, the October 12th, 1972 issue of Jet mentioned that Cunningham and Franklin were scouting locations in Spain for a film that he will direct and which she will uh, star. The movie never happened. Now, Cecil was shopping around for Aretha, a new label, okay? Her contract with Atlantic was up March 31st, and he was reportedly talking to ABC, Dunhill, Columbia, and Warner Brothers. Her price tag was $5 million, okay? Now, let me say this. Cecil later said in the book, that uh, when he went to those record labels and said, listen, I got Aretha right here. She won five million. Them niggas was like, five million? Five million? You know your sister ain't had no hits in I don't know when, right? I don't know. Mm. We'll give her, I don't know. So Atlantic said they'd give her three million, said Ruth. I said that was nothing. She needed twice that, okay? On the other hand, Cecil, who is a little cautious because he knows that um, he went to the other people, you know, the other labels, and said, you know, Aretha is free. She won five million, and them niggas was like, she ain't gonna get it, at least not from us. What okay. Ruth told Cecil was that, uh, yeah, go ahead on out there and you shop other labels. What's that gonna do is that's gonna make Ahmet and uh, Atlantic very nervous because they had just lost millions 
because they didn't play ball with Ray Charles. Okay, that's what you're not going to do. When Ray Charles say, give me the money, nigga, give me the money. And they made that mistake with him. And they was not going to do the same mistake with Aretha. Now, the guy who worried me the most was Clive Davis, said Wexler. He worries all of us the most. Matter of fact, I'm still afraid for some of these singers that still fuck with him. I'm like, did you sign your soul to the devil, y'all? It's... it's is all his acts sacrifices to the devil? Jerry Wexler continues to say, in the early 70s, he also saw the money in rhythm and blues. That's when he went after Bigger. He had signed Earth, Wind & Fire and also cut a distribution deal with Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff at Philly International, who were terrific writers and producers. Clive saw that Philly International was red hot, okay? And because they possessed the OJs and Harold Melvin and the Blue Lump, Notes they were positioned to be the next Motown. Now, Ruth Bowman said, I told uh, Cecil, I don't, give a, I don't give a fuck what they got over there at Columbia. I don't give a fuck. Okay, you stick to your guns. Arista ain't Arista no more. They owned by Warner. And trust me, Warner got it. Go ahead and tell them people that you want six, uh, six million dollars, okay? And guess what? We, we got On January 16th, 1973, her stability was shaken by the death of Clara Ward. C.L. Franklin was by Clara's side. Both he and Aretha performed at her funeral in Philadelphia. In March 1973, she returned to the studio to cut Let Me In Your Life. The hope was that back with the Wexler crew, she could reverse the downward sales slide that had started with Hey Now Hey. Mm -hmm. That goddamn Quincy Jones. He, he, that nigga, he threw roots at her. He threw roots at her. Erica, it was, it, he must have cast a spell on, on her, God damn it. That's why he crazy now. That's why Quincy Jones is crazy now, because he put roots on my goddamn Riri, that damn black bullshit album that he At this point, Wexler is like, we done paid this lady all this money, and we ain't get shit. Nothing's working for her. The album did not perform. Okay. So Aretha is lunching again, okay? And I'm not making fun of mental health, but, you know, I'm not going to get into it. But anyway, Aretha is lunching again. She's starting to have nightmares, okay? So what she did was she called her big sister, Irma. Please, Irma, come stay with me, okay? In my townhouse that I just recently bought over there, okay? Come stay with me. Irma said, baby, I can't do it, okay? I'm, I'm still working. I got to take care of my thing. Fortunately, she got two sisters. She got two brothers, too, but it seemed like we don't ever talk about Vaughn. All right. I need to find out where the hell Vaughn Franklin is, her older half-brother. That's what you people say, half, because even though me and my brother got two different daddies, I don't give a fuck, okay? Matter of fact, no, they came from the same vagina, so they hold. That's how it works. You come from the same vagina, you supposedly hold, but you come from the same pickle you had. I don't know. I don't know. It's all brothers to me. I'm not putting half in front of shit. What ended but, up happening was Irma said call Carolyn. Carolyn was available. Carlin had came to stay with Aretha and, you know, her then beau to help her sister get through uh, the nightmare period that she Now, was from the jet, April 12, 1973, Aretha buries rumors about her going crazy. It was no small wonder that many of Franklin's followers registered dismay over erroneous reports coming out of New York that Miss Franklin was hospitalized for a nervous breakdown. Okay. Now this is the first time that Aretha caused a called a press conference because you know that's what them you know rich actresses in Hollywood people do. They they got to get in front of the shit, right? But this was the first time that she went in front of the television to tell that goddamn lie. I'm fine. Okay. I'm just mentally exhausted. That's it. Now the other thing was that Ken, no matter how much of a good heart he has, he's encroaching on Cecil. Okay, he assumed that he could sometimes act as manager for Aretha Franklin. Answer no. Riri don't play that shit with her brother because after all, which I didn't know, yes, Ruth Bowman said, uh, Cecil, uh, yeah, you the new manager, but C.L. Smooth was the one who told Aretha, make your brother the manager. And what Aretha was not going to do was disobey her father. So Ruth okay. Bowman says that when it came down to Ken, Aretha was always complimentary, okay? He received her highest marks and regards. However, the relationship didn't last because she felt that Ken didn't grant Cecil the respect that her brother deserved. 
Eventually, what happened, Ken was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. You don't respect me as your man. Ah, ah, ah. Aretha was like, okay. Okay, bye. So, come the spring of that same year, Aretha had did a pop-up over there down to the Reverend, what's his name? The Reverend Walker's Church in Harlem. Aretha had sang Amazing Grace as a surprise to the churchgoers, okay? They said that it took them 30 minutes to calm down and get back to the service. Man, I'm done. After Aretha Franklin had sang in front of me, Amazing Grace, I'm done. Here go my $20, I'm out. Moving okay. on that same month, she sang Rock Steady on the Soul Train. On October 14th, 1974, she went into the studio to start recording what would be with Everything I Feel In Me, an album that would mark a further decline in quality and sales. Now, this is Ooh. funny. Okay, so during the summer of 1974, when the Watergate scandal resulted in Nixon, Nixon's resignation, Cecil remembered a certain joy in the Franklin's camp. All of us, Daddy, Ken, Aretha, couldn't wait to see Nixon bite the dust. Okay, said Cecil, we had a goodbye party for Tricky Dicky. And this, this, this is the part that fucks me up. How do y'all ask a previous president to resign for what the fuck this president do all the time? I'm going to leave that there. Now, this is something, a little small fact that I want to tell you guys. At her birthday party, because you know she throw a fabulous birthday party every year, she had guests. Okay, of course, you know, her big name guests. But at this party, it was the Spinners. What Ruth Bowman explained was that the Spinners owed, um, what's her name, Aretha Franklin, a lot. Because, after all, the Spinners, when their label dropped them, Aretha Franklin had convinced Atlantic to pick them up, okay? So they were still working at that point because of Aretha Franklin. We loved Jerry Wexler, said Cecil. For a long time, he and Tommy David and Aretha Mandarin, or Marden, were the right team for Aretha. Their work together will probably live forever, but all good things must come to an end. My now, because uh, Aretha is not having much success in the uh, record world, Ruth Bowman knew that her client wanted to get into movies, okay? Ruth Bowman says that my job was to let the world know that Aretha had found domestic bliss in California and was ready to get into the acting world. Okay. Curtis Mayfield had known the Franklin family for years. We loved Curtis when he was with the Impressions and we loved him when he went solo. Carolyn told me, meaning David Ritz, not only was he a fabulous singer, but he possessed genius as a songwriter. People get ready, keep on pushing, gypsy woman, the list goes on. So when Carolyn ran into the Curtis Mayfield, he said, hey girl, what you doing? What you doing? I'm working on a score, okay? Now, we all knew that Curtis was a bad mother hunchy when it comes down to scores, okay? Hey, some of my best soundtrack albums, you know, hands down, the greatest uh, soundtrack ever is Claudine, hands down, okay? But I don't think he got the Claudine yet, but he would, he had done Superfly. I'm your mama, I'm your daddy, I'm that nigga in the alley. Oh, I can't, I don't know all of it. Here's some church, here's some weed, some coke, here's some feed, something like that, right? But we know that was a bad, oh my, God. that Superfly soundtrack was a bird mother hunch, okay? So, Carlin is like, you working on something else? What you working on, brother? Do tell, okay? He say, I'm working on a score for a movie. Okay, it's about three sisters, like you, Carolyn, who crossed over from the gospel world to the R&B world. Carolyn thought in her head it would be perfect for Aretha. Big is, is that Curtis wasn't thinking about Aretha. Curtis wanted Carolyn. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. Now, remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves, 
my love bugs and my bellas. Let's be safe.